To go in the dark with a light is to know the light. To know the dark, go dark. Go without sight and find that the dark too blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. Duluth is such a vibrant city and has so many wonderful amenities that it's really become a tourist destination for the five-state area. The lake is just an unbelievable experience. When you come across the top of Spirit Mountain, across the top of that hill and see that, it's like really none other. The hillside is beautiful and there's an incredible view of Canal Park, of the moonlight on the water. Every night I go out and look at the stars. I find the Big Dipper, I look for the Pleiades. Um, I just enjoy basking in the darkness under the starlight. I think the majority of us who live here appreciate the nature that we have and we don't want to lose it and darkness is part of that natural experience. People forget that darkness is what the earth is about half the time. It's not something that we want to get rid of even in the downtown metropolitan area. We want to do so sparingly and carefully and thoughtfully. Uh, and that's not what's happening. One night, I looked out my window and it looked like it had snowed. It was that white. So they put in these white lights. It was shocking to me. I felt violated. I actually felt violated. I felt like, why are you ruining my view? I live in the middle of a block in an older neighborhood. They've put in the bright 4,000 on one pole. And I really don't even like to walk the dog under it. It almost hurts your skin to be under it. The new LED lights that have been installed, I've seen them on Woodland Avenue and, and some other streets. I don't like the, the light it produces. Those are so super bright. Uh, it screws up the ambiance of Duluth. I instantly wrote my city council folks. In May of 2016, the city of Duluth, Minnesota held a meeting to show the new lighting plan for the Superior Street Reconstruction Program. Business owners became concerned when they found that the new street lights would cast a much whiter color and drastically change the look of downtown. So we wanted to make sure that we had some input on defining the lighting because the color of the light is going to be the most important factor in determining how that street will look and feel. We have a core group of uh, citizens and business owners that are involved and at this time we have nearly a thousand forty people signed on the petition to stop the installation of 4000 K lighting and to gather public input before proceeding farther on the program. And we're working with Starry Skies trying to develop a comprehensive lighting program that includes public input. We are a local nonprofit run entirely by volunteers and we work to stop the spread of light pollution, reduce it where we can, educate and provide outreach to the public. Cities all over the country are moving towards using the white LED lights as part of an energy efficiency movement, which I think is great, but we got kind of ahead of ourselves. Duluth and other cities went ahead with the really bright white LED lights, and so I'm seeing a brighter, whiter night instead of the yellow glow that we were seeing before. In September of 2017, the Starry Skies organization in Duluth hosted a lighting seminar and brought experts from around the nation to speak about the recent changes in lighting technology and how it can affect our environment, our health, and our ability to see the stars. Every city is going to switch to LEDs because of the energy savings. So that, that you know, whether it's Duluth or any other city, that's going to happen. The question is, uh, what what kind of LED? One of the ways of characterizing um, what white light seems like, is it warmer or cooler? We hear a lot about this these days. You know, do you want cool white or do you want warm white? So one of the measures is the correlated color temperature and the unit of that measure is Kelvin. So we go out to the store, hardware store, and we're looking at especially the newer LED lamps and we've got this number that says 2700K or it says 6500K. What that number is referring to is essentially the blue content of that light. Warmer light tends to have less blue and cooler white has more blue in it. The pupillary response of the human eye, uh, its peak sensitivity is the same frequency as the peak blue output in an LED light, which is about the color of my shirt. 
The amber and the, and the red frequencies don't compromise your adaptation or instill that pupillary response like the, the blue colors do. It's pure human physiology. Human beings haven't evolved to be exposed to artificial light at night, and so any kind of exposure to any kind of light has potentially negative consequences. Blue, rich, white light tends to be the worst kind of light for us to be uh, exposed to at night. There has been a day-night cycle for nature for billions of years, and now we are radically changing that. We receive light between sunrise and sunset, and then it's darkness. We're just getting minimal light from the moon or, or you know, the star, starlight. The advent of electrical lighting changed the shape of that light-dark schedule that we have evolved to. We had the pleasure of talking with lighting expert Ian Ashton, who is the senior scientist for Sun Tracker Technology, and he took time to give us his expertise on the subject. In order for the body to prepare itself for going to sleep, the pineal gland produces a hormone called melatonin, and that helps essentially turn off our brain and allow us to sleep. Interesting thing about the pineal gland is controlled by a small section of the brain which receives light signal from the retina of our eyes. And it's mainly blue light which is detected. If there's too much blue light, the brain interprets that as well. It's still daylight out. There's no point in producing melatonin and going to sleep. By exposing yourself to light at night, you are also disrupting your biological clock. So you're literally changing the timing of your biological clock such that physiological responses, including cellular growth and proliferation, is going to happen at the wrong times. Shift workers have uh, a really hard time because they're being exposed to artificial light at night in a way that human beings have never evolved to. There's a vast body of literature, epidemiologic studies in humans, uh, as well as control lab studies in humans and animal models, that all show how light exposure, particularly shift work, is associated with breast cancer. There are studies that show a link between shift work and prostate cancer, shift work and obesity. Melatonin has been shown to reduce tumor growth. If you've got less melatonin, then that will enable the tumors to proliferate faster. In 2016, the American Medical Association issued a statement recommending that the Kelvin temperature for streetlights be 3000 K or less. The fact that the industry has responded to these concerns by introducing 2700K and 3000K LED streetlights as catalog product over the last two years is telling. Let's say 2700 Kelvin is, is safe light, right, before bedtime. I think it should be much warmer than that. Uh, it should be 1900 or so. If you take even red light, which the human sleep and circadian system is least responsive to, and you make it bright enough, Right? So you're essentially giving enough photons for the photoreceptors to respond, you will elicit a strong response. And so just because you're using warmer light doesn't mean you, know, you can just use as much of it as you want. It has to be dim as well. The increasing amount of uh, artificial light is causing the skies to become uh, brighter and brighter at night due to uh, light reflected back from the, the air molecules. What they don't realize is about half of the light pollution is due to street lighting. And about another third uh, is due to uh, commercial parking lot uh, lighting. Not only are we putting out the, uh, the same amount of light uh, from the pictures, but we're also lighting up areas we haven't lit up before. So if you look at it on a global scale with the uh, satellite photographs, it's clearly evident. That, yes, we're, I think we're putting in too much light simply because we can. Color temperature really does matter and it is pretty easy to overlight a residential neighborhood. Residential neighborhoods are not arterial roadways. You know, they're where people live, walk their dogs, take evening walks, and overlighting a residential roadway, in many cases, has worse public acceptance than an underlit residential roadway. If you look at the 4th Street Corridor project, we have seven LED lights per block, whereas the street above it and the street below it have one light fixture per block. So there's a great amount of additional energy being used to power those lights that really are not needed. Light trespass is light going where you don't want it, which for most citizens means you're providing a free nighttime lighting for their bedrooms. 
As they were putting up lights on the Saba, it was obnoxious. And then one night it was actually shining into my own living room. So I had to buy a shade like they use in Alaska for midnight sun. Do those lights need to be on? That's the first question. And the second question is, why are you shining it at my house? If you have an area that you're concerned about, put up the shielding which uh, limits the light to that area. Don't get me involved in it. The problem is we don't want all of these residential zones as well as commercial zones to look like indoor retail lighting where it's just bright, bright, white light 24-7. We don't want that to be where we live. We don't want that to be our neighborhood. Human health isn't the only concern when it comes to light pollution. The environment, wildlife, and in particular, the birds of the air should also be considered when updating the lighting in Duluth. One of the speakers at our Starry Sky seminar in September was Laura Erickson, who is an expert on bird migration and follows the migration through the city of Duluth. Duluth is right in the epicenter of the huge bird migration pathway. Once they clear Duluth, they can scatter every which way. But because we get so many of the inland birds and so many of them are migratory and so many of them are nocturnal migrants, having all this extra light is going to be harmful. They navigate by getting up high enough that they're above the tree line and above even the low cloud line and use the stars. Uh, they know where Polaris is and they follow it. Lake Superior is very, very dark, except where there are ships. If they have any light, it draws in birds, especially when it's foggy. They fly straight toward a light because in their evolutionary memory, that's the moon and end up sometimes in the water where there's no hope at all. Now that we're getting brighter and brighter lights, the light is drawing birds from a wider area. Every light strung along the high bridge is a beacon telling birds, if you're confused in this lake fog, go straight for the bridge. And if they collide at the bridge, nobody's ever going to find their carcasses. But also any lights on tall buildings, any light that's going up toward the space where they are is going to totally confuse them. We know that birds nesting in light from street lights and other things causes a definite rising in their corticosterone level. That is a hormone that is produced under stress. Birds have lower reproductive success when their corticosterone level goes up. So it's gonna hurt our birds, both the migrating ones and our backyard birds. Internally, a bird's circadian rhythm is shorter than 24 hours. So every morning, they wake up a little bit earlier. In spring, they wake up and it's getting light each day. And their bodies react because their bodies know it's spring, their sex organs get all ready to make baby birds, uh, and they get ready to migrate. In fall, after the summer solstice, when they wake up a little bit earlier, it's still dark. And day after day, it's still dark. That's turning off their reproduction and getting them ready for fall migration. Artificial lights can confuse them in both seasons. The way we solve it at nighttime is by turning off lights that we aren't using. A lot of offices used to keep the lights on as security, but when they turn the lights off on nights, the birds are migrating. All of a sudden they noticed that their electric bills were going down during the months of bird migration. They thought, well, we can do this all year, and that's a good thing for everybody. Another factor to consider in LED lighting is safety. Some say that the more light there is, the safer it is. But is that really the case? What happens with our eyes when we see bright lights is that our pupils constrict. So we take in less light and it, and it essentially makes it harder to see when you have lights shining in your face. So you can be essentially blinded by too much light. Driving at night has also become a concern in regards to the new bright white LED lights that have replaced traditional vehicle headlights. The blue enriched light scatters throughout the eye's cornea, making it harder to adjust to the darkness of the road after the bright lights have passed. 
I know personally as a driver, I mean, I'm 65 years old and my eyes don't adapt well, but that means that young people driving on the road with me, even if their eyes are adjusting, they are suddenly dealing with the 65 year old who can't suddenly see because the light's too bright. We think because there are lots of bright lights that there are no dangers, um, and that's simply not the case. The futility of increasing lighting to decrease crime is perhaps most notably shown in the Morrow Hutton Report of 2000. In 1998, the city of Chicago experienced a surge in violent crime and responded by increasing the light throughout the city. Existing lighting was increased three to five times the lumen levels and new light was added as well. Although citizens were pleased by the proactive response of their government, the report showed that the rate of crime did not go down in the areas of increased lighting. In fact, in these areas, the crime rates increased. The areas without the increased lighting actually saw a decrease in crime. A five-year study in the United Kingdom yielded similar results when the crime rates in two cities with similar demographics were observed. One city was given new and increased lighting, and the other kept the pre-existing lighting. No significant variation in crime occurred between the two cities. There's been some advocates in the marketplace saying that 4,000K is safer than 3,000K. The safety aspect is, is completely a red herring. As a registered professional engineer whose public safety is my number one charge, if 3,000K or 2,700K wasn't safe, I certainly wouldn't be specifying it. The color rendering index, how colors are portrayed under various light sources, is far more important to first responders such that they can recognize color of clothing, vehicle color, facial recognition. Your roadway products, 2700K, 3000K, 4000K, they typically all have the same color rendering indices. As to the energy saving components, up until uh, about two years ago, the 4000K definitely had more energy efficiency than the 2700K or 3000K warm white products. That delta has closed dramatically in the last year to where there's only about a 5% difference in energy efficiency. From my perspective as a professional engineer, there really is no disparity in the energy efficiency of the sources. There are now lights that we could choose that are in the 3000K uh, level and, and, and less that do everything we need without giving us the problems that the, the 4000K light does. The smart choice is to go with the lights that uh, do everything we need and pose less risk to us health-wise. LEDs also offer the possibility which previous like fluorescence and, and, and incandescence didn't where we can switch over from 6500 Kelvin to 1900 Kelvin the flick of a switch. You can make them brighter and dimmer easily. We can use them uh, creatively to our own advantage. Davis had, had done some pilot studies before they did their implementation phase. But there was about a two year gap between their data collection and their ultimate installation of the 4000K product. Once the 4000K LED street lighting was installed in residential neighborhoods, it was met with vociferous public resistance to the point where city council meetings were literally overflowing with citizenry asking that the 4000K decision be uh, strongly revisited. There were more pilots performed, including a 2700K product at half the wattage, which interestingly enough uh, was met with great public acceptance. We've seen all over the country the public pushback to the 4,000K lights to where 2,700K is, be, is garnering big market shares. Public officials that aren't keeping up with the changing technologies and the tendencies around the country might be you know, missing the boat. We have, to, we have to engage not just the scientists or not just the policymakers um, and not even just one group of scientists, you know, if you're just dealing with energy efficiency, your choices will be different than if you're considering the effects on sleep and circadian rhythms. Conversely, if you just worry about sleep and circadian rhythms, the lighting that you might get is not very practical. So we all have to work together um, and come up with a solution that works best for everybody. Whether you choose uh, 3000K or 4000K should be left up 
to uh, certainly in residential areas should be left up to the citizens. If you're going to be uh, living with those fixtures for the next 20 years, uh, lighting up your streets and uh, any spill light going into your uh, your bedrooms, whatnot, I think uh, the focus has to be on the citizens' uh, choice rather than just uh, the economics of the engineering. If the municipality is concerned about uh, saving of energy with the higher color temperature, look instead at uh, using the lighting control technology to dim the fixtures or turn them off at night. For street lighting, probably be uh, dimming, which you can easily do with LEDs. You can save a lot more energy doing that and a lot faster a return on investment. I can't stress it enough, pilot projects are critically important. Let residents see what the proposed system would look like and give them some choices. Let them opine on what they want in their neighborhoods. They're the ones who have to live with these fixtures for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Give the people what they're comfortable with while still adhering to fiscal responsibility and to the needs of first responders. The question we get a lot is how folks can get engaged with the effort. And there's so much you can do just as a homeowner or just as a citizen. You can point your lights downward. That's step number one for sure. You can put them on a timer or even better put them on a motion sensor light so they're only on when somebody is moving and needs to see where they're going. You can check out the IDA's lighting guide. They have dark sky approved lighting fixtures and uh, you can also check out our own website starryskiesls.org. You can work to educate your neighbors, your friends, your family, and just talk to them about light pollution. It's a topic that people don't really know much about or really engage with very often. And so there's just a lot of awareness building that needs to happen before people can even get started taking steps to reduce light pollution. You have to know it's there before you can do anything about it. We have a petition right now that you can sign in at Victor's in the Superior Street Lobby. We call it our Dark Sky Lobby. There's a lot of material there that you can pick up. We have brochures talking about light pollution, talking about the effects on wildlife, human health, how we can save money, and about crime and safety. You have to be educated for sure. There are things happening right now, decisions being made right now that will affect the Duluth night for decades to come. Now is the time to be involved. Now is the time to be communicating with decision makers. We're very much at a crossroads when it comes to lighting our nights. The question is, how do you want to define the streetscape of Duluth? Do you want it to be white, more of an industrial looking zone, or do you want to provide a warm, tranquil evening environment that will attract tourists and residents alike? With Lake Superior as its backdrop, Duluth has great potential for developing a dark sky program. Citizens and business owners alike are looking forward to working with local governments to create a program that protects one of our most valuable resources and guides other cities around the world to do the same.